start looking in just a few moments at verses 8 through 11 of Genesis chapter number 26. <clears throat> when you find your place there, stand with me and we'll, uh, we'll have a word of prayer. We're going to review just a little bit, verses 1 through 7, then look at these verses together. <clears throat> but uh, I want us to have prayer first, because I'll tell you what, I believe uh, this, you know, when you preach messages, you, there's usually a mixture of it being pointed toward the saint or, you know, the person who's saved, the saint, or the person who is, uh, is lost. And sometimes you have a mixture of those things. We do try to do those things things together, but I would say the majority of this this morning is for those of us who profess to know Christ as our Savior. So I, I just want us to have prayer in that manner that we pray for our, ourselves and for each other, but let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be here again this morning. We're grateful for the singing, the songs, the playing. Uh, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to come and gather around your truth. Lord, I'm so grateful that I know the Word of God is your truth. I'm so grateful to know that your son will save. I'm so grateful to know that we have power over sin and we have a great privilege of meeting here and a great privilege of sharing the gospel. Father, and I know we have enemies. We know we have the world, we have the flesh, we have the devil. And Lord, we know that sin is uh, a destroyer, a destroyer of, of saints' lives. We, we know that he can bring terrible consequences in this world to the saint. And Father, I pray that we would heed what is said here this morning, God, in your word. And Lord, we would respond to it to keep ourselves from those temporal judgments, God. We know that sin has a horrible consequence on those who do not know you, particularly the sin of not believing on your son. Father, we know that is an eternal consequence. And Father, I pray if there be one here this morning that doesn't know you, that's never trusted your son as their Savior, what he is and what he did for them as their Savior, God, that they would do that today. And will we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You be seated. When we look this morning in verse number 8 through verse number 11, I want us to review just a moment, uh, for just a moment, what we saw in verses 1 through 7. I uh, some background passages for this would probably be when uh, Abraham went down into Egypt in Genesis chapter number 12 and brought Hagar out with him. And we know the chaos that that caused in his family and, and in many ways still today. And, and we also remember when Abraham in Genesis chapter 20 went down to Gerar, where his son Isaac is, is in chapter 26 of Genesis, and he lied, Abraham did, about who Sarah was to him, his wife Sarah. Remember, he told him back in Genesis chapter 20 that Sarah was his sister, and when actually she was his wife. Well, that is a very similar situation that's going on with Isaac here. And we started this last week. We're just going to continue it this week. But we've, we've entitled it. I don't think I talked about this last week. We've entitled it though, like father, like son, like everyone. What does that even mean? It means this, that we're all sinners. It, it means we're all sinners. And Abraham, uh, as a believer line, Isaac comes along as a believer and does the same thing in Genesis 26. And anybody in this room has done it, will do it. And we need to know what consequences are to those things and also how to get out of those things when we do get in, into them. What happens when the saint sins? Uh, that's the thing we need to keep in front of. It's just that phrase. But why is Isaac in Gerar? Um, why is he in front of a ruler by the name of Abimelech? Well, we find out in chapter uh, uh, 26, verse 1, there was a famine in the land. That's what verse 1 tells us. That's why he's uh, in Gerar. That's why Isaac, Abraham's son, is there. In verse 2, God, for, God forbids Isaac from going down into Egypt. Uh, he tells him not to go down there. God probably forbade Isaac from going down to Egypt because of all that happened when his father Abraham went down there, as we said in Genesis chapter number 12, verses 10 through uh, 20. You know what? This is something we all need to think about. 
And he's, uh, Abraham did it in Genesis 12, went down to Egypt. He should have stayed in the promised land where God had placed him. And then we look at Genesis chapter number 26 where God in verse 2 has warned Isaac not to go down to uh, uh, Egypt. And I think it is this right here. We all have a tendency to overreact when things come, don't we? Uh, you all saw the gas issues that we had for, and there's no, uh, you know, and all the craziness that came about with that. All the craziness that came about with COVID. We all have a tendency to overreact when, when things like that happen. Well, God knew that Isaac had that same type of tendency, and he may overreact and, and, do, and go somewhere where he shouldn't be, which is out of the promised land. God put him in the promised land and he didn't want him to leave there and go to Egypt. Egypt is the promised land. He wanted him to be where God had placed him and that's what we learn in verse number 2. In verse 3, God instructs Isaac to stay in the place where he has went in verse number 1. Isaac went down to Gerar in verse number 1. He's still in the promised land. He's before a ruler of Amalek who's the ruler of the Philistines and but God tells him to stay there in verse number 3. And then when you look down at verses 4 and 5, the Abrahamic covenant is reaffirmed to Isaac. Uh, God promises to do for Isaac what he promised to do for Abraham. He promised him land to Abraham. He promised him seed or people. And he promised him blessings, spiritual blessings, physical blessings. Uh, and, and God re, uh, confirms those, if you will, to Isaac in uh, verses 4 and 5. Then when you get down to verse number 6, uh, it tells us that Isaac obeyed God's instructions uh, that he gave him in verse number three. He, uh, Isaac stayed where God told him to stay, so he's off to a fantastic start. But unfortunately, verse number seven comes along, and here's what the, the, here's where the problems for Isaac begins. Look at verse number seven. We looked at this closely last week. We'll just skim over it because it helps us to understand what we're looking at this morning. And the, it says in verse seven, and the men of the place talking about Gerar, asked him, Isaac, of his wife, Rebekah. And he, Isaac, said, she is my sister. That is the lie that he told. And why did he tell the lie? Well, if you look down here, it says, for he feared. So he was afraid. And, and we said this last week. This is the emotion that faithlessness causes. This is the emotion that it causes when, when, God, when God's presence when his promises we tried to put come across with this last week are abandoned by us, well, we choose or we choose not to fellowship with him because it really is a choice that we make uh, to the saved uh, person anyways. A person who wants to live to please the Lord when they are confronted with situations where they control it uh, or like he controlled what he told Abimelech or if it's something that's uncontrolled by us like uh, uh, the famine that come into the land on Isaac. It doesn't matter if it's controlled or uncontrolled. You know what you and I must do? We must make biblical decisions. We must make, what is a biblical decision? It is a decision where I can go to the scriptures and I can say, right, here's an example of it. Here's what God said to do. Or here's what God, uh, here's the situation and here's what that person did. Here's what I shouldn't do. And so that's what we can kind of take from Jacob or from Isaac, I mean, this morning. The person who wants to please the Lord, we said this last week, asks, is it right? The person who wants to please the Lord asks, is it right? And the person who is living faithlessly asks, is it safe? And Isaac asked that latter question, is it safe? And he thought it was, even though God had placed him there. But anyways, it says, for he feared, verse 7, to say she is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill him for Rebekah. As we said, God had told him to, uh, to stay there. God told him to be in that land. God even told him he would bless him in that land. But somehow he's gotten into his mind and he's fearful. The flesh is weak, no doubt about it. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we disregard the promises of God or what many saints today who have trusted Christ but don't know the scriptures, when we don't know the promises of God, we're going to make bad decisions, terrible decisions, life-offering decisions. And that's why it's so important to know the truth of God's word. And so why would they want 
Rebecca so bad. Well, look down at the end of verse 7 because she was fair to look upon. You know what that means? She was beautiful. You know what that means? She was hot. That's what that means. She, that's what it means. And so uh, that's, that's what he was dealing with. He was spiritful of. Now let's transition to verse number 8. Look at verse number 8 with me. And I want to say this right out of the gate. What is sad to me is when the morality of the worldly is greater than the practical sanctification of the saint. You think about that for just a moment. What, what, what saddens me when the world is more moral than the person who knows Christ. Amen. When, you know what? When you and I get saved, we've said this so many times, we are positionally set apart to God. We are sanctified. We belong to him. That's why he chastens us. That's why we were able to say, Our Father which art in heaven, and pray to him. We are set apart to him. But, when, but there's also a, a practical part of that sanctification. And you know how that grows? When we study and read and obey the word of God. Amen. When Jesus, when it was spoken in the book of John, chapter 17, he said, Sanctify them or set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And when those things are not so, these embarrassing situations for the saint can happen. When the worldly have a morality higher than the practical sanctification of the person who says they trust Christ and know him and love him. But anyways, look at verse 8. The lie has been told, and it came to pass when he had been there a long time. Talking about Isaac. It's a long time ago he, stole, he, he told this lie. And I want us to think about this for just one moment. It's been a long time. You said, why didn't God move in immediately? Well, here's one of the reasons I believe he didn't. I don't think the text is clear on this, but I do think it tells us he was there a long time without God intervening in this. Abimelech doesn't know yet that Isaac lied. And Isaac has not bothered to make it right with Abimelech either. It's been a long time since these things have happened. Do you know what I believe this is for Isaac? It is a time of grace for him to get this thing right with God and with the person he's wronged. I believe this long time was given to Isaac so he could have a way out of his sinful situation before God had to step in. You think about that. How is it so many professing believers can live sinfully and God not step in? I think the problem is they don't know Christ. If I can live sinfully and God has never convicted me who lives in me, the things that I do never, uh, God never pricks me in my heart, squeezes my heart over those things because he lives in me. Perhaps the, the issue is I've never, I don't know the gospel. I've never trusted Christ. One or both of those things perhaps could be true. But when we are the saint, when we've trusted Christ and we have sinned, often God gives us a space of time to make that right. That's right. He often, he is gracious in that. He is merciful in that. When, when believers are involved with sin, God in his mercy gives us the opportunity to repent of that sin and to forsake it before he must step in. There, there was some sinful actions. You, you'll remember this. There were some sinful actions going on in the church in Corinth in the New Testament. They were having the Lord's Supper and they, it was a debacle. They, there was things going on that should ever be named among God's people. And God had given them a space to take care of that. And Paul gives them a warning that that space will not last forever. And I'm here to tell you this morning and myself, let me keep this in my soul. Let me keep this in my heart. I may be sinning as a saint, but I'll tell you what, the mercy of God and the grace of God will come to a point to where he says, I'm going to step in and handle this in your life because I, you will not. And here's what he tells the church at Corinth regarding that. Listen to 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, in other words, call it sin, 
whatever it is. Not it's uh, not let's call it something else. Not call it somebody else's fault or something like that, but just call it what it is. It's sin. And repent of it, forsake it. That's what he's saying. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, and he means of God. If we would judge ourselves, we'd say, you know what? This sin is true in my life. I must repent of it. That means to turn away from it and forsake it. God would not have to step in and chastise me or discipline me for it. And that's basically what he's going to say also in verse 32. And here's what the verse says when we don't do that. Verse 32, and, and, and Corinth is our example. But when we are judged, and he's talking about of God, we are chastened of the Lord. You know what that means to be chastened? It means to be disciplined. The book of Hebrews talks about that. He says that he chastens those that he loves. Who is that? That's his saints. That's right. And then you also know what he says in verse number eight when he doesn't chasten those who are sinning. He says they're not his. They're illegitimate. The word he uses there in the King James is bastard and not a son. That's what he says. Wouldn't you like for the people to hear that? They can go on and sin in disobedience to God's words, but it's never brought to their attention by God. Perhaps they, the only issue is they just don't belong to it. True. Then he says this in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two, and we should not be condemned with the world. So let me read that, that whole thing again. Verse 32, but when we are judged of God, he says, we are chastened to the Lord, disciplined of him, that we should not be condemned with the world. Does he mean eternal damnation? Certainly not. You and I as believers cannot be eternally damned. For Christ has took our sin. He has took God's wrath for us. He is not talking about that. But do you know the same things that come upon unbelievers in this world come upon believers? Why? I'm talking about when they sin. Because God must step in and judge that sin that we will not take care of ourselves. That's right. And, and he goes on to say this. He says that we should not be condemned with the world. The things that come upon the present world because of its sin does not have to come upon the believer. You know why? Because we can confess it as sin. We can beseech God for his mercy and grace. I mean, call upon him for it. Say, yes, I know I did it. Yes, I know it is sin against you and against your throne and against the very person that you have made me positionally. Forgive me. Be merciful to me. I don't want to be condemned with the world for something my God has already paid for. He's paid for the sin. I'm not going to be eternally punished for it. There's no way. That's what I mean by that. But there are consequences to it. What do you think is going to be the consequence of the church not sharing the gospel, which is in direct disobedience to truth? What do you think is going to be the consequence of the church not gathering just like this to hear the truth of God's word? You say, what's going to be the consequences? You're seeing it. That's right. You don't have to wait to see it. You're seeing it. People who have sat in church all their lives have sat in darkness. They don't know the gospel. And they're lost. You don't know how to be saved, you're not saved. That's just the plainness of it. And so, but when we are saved and we sin, get back to that. Let us get rid of that. Look, notice the rest of verse number eight. It says, Isaac, uh, this says that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out the window. He's seen, he's been given a long time to confess this sin. Isaac has, but he wouldn't do it. And so what happens? Just what happened in Corinth? God must step in. He will not allow his saints to go unchecked in sin. In any time, Old or New Testament. And so that Abimelech, it says, king of the Philistines, looked out the window and saw and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Do you know what that means? 
He was showing endearment to her. He was acting toward her like a husband acts towards his wife. He was, uh, I love the way it puts it here, uh, sporting. He was treating, he was acting toward Rebecca, Isaac was, not the way a man acts toward his sister, but the way a man acts towards his wife. We can, we can, I want to tell you, out of all the negative, though, that we see from Isaac in this chapter, we can take a positive from Isaac right here as well. After decades of marriage, at least two decades, He still wants to sport with his wife. <laughs> you make all that what you want. He still wants to sport with his wife. After years of marriage, we get to where we can't keep our hands off our work, our hands off of our TV remotes, and our hands off of our hobbies. But we ought to get back to sporting with our wives. Amen. Amen. There you go. <laughs> I don't need a report on that, though. I'll take your word that that's going to happen. <laughs> I lost where I was. <laughs> I didn't expect that. But I want you to hear this, too. I wanted, you to, I wanted to point out to you how Abimelech learns of this. Do you, do you all remember how, remember we said Abimelech is like the word for Pharaoh in Egypt. It's really not a name per se. It's more of a title of a ruler. Well, if you look back at Abraham's life, he ran into a ruler as well that went by the title of Abimelech. Do you remember how God revealed Abraham's sin with Sarah to that of Elmelech. Look back at Genesis chapter 20 and verse number 3. And let's read that very quickly and see. The same situation that's going on in Genesis 26 is pretty much going on in Genesis 20. And here's how it comes to be. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. God appears to him in a dream and says, one you've taken into your harem, you cannot do that. She's another man's wife. She was Abraham's wife. Well, that's not how this one works out. God does things differently, doesn't he? We can take general rules, but sometimes God works things out differently, but he'll always be glorified. His truth will always be on. We can always count on those things, but... Uh, but I want you to see that. Uh, but what does God do in this opportunity in Genesis chapter 26? He allows Abimelech to go to the window. The window. And look out and see him, Isaac, sporting with the Rebecca. Do you know what has just happened to Isaac? Providentially. Chance, whatever some people got. Providentially, though, God stepped in. Isaac wouldn't handle his sin. Isaac wouldn't handle his, uh, his sin against God. God steps in, allows Abimelech to go over, look out the window, and see that that's not how you treat your sister. Do you know what's happened to him? Isaac's sin has found him out. Look at verse number nine. It's revealed, Abimelech called Isaac. I cannot imagine this walk. You ever done something as a kid? And you remember that walk back when they yelled for you? When they used your whole name to call you back home? You knew it wasn't for beans and taters. You knew something was probably for a belt. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold of a surety, she is thy wife. And how sayest thou, she is my sister? Can you imagine the shame that was on Isaac's face? Can you imagine the shame and conviction that was on him for this? And I'll tell you how I know he was, because he knew the Lord. You call a sinner 
a person that don't know Christ into the same situation, they'll lie again. Because there's nothing there to put the rails up like they are in the saints' life. The presence of God, the truth of God, the meaning is of God's people. I, I want you to remember, I know you remember this verse. Certainly the folks from Wednesday night, you remember it. In Numbers 32, 23. But I want you to hear this is what, what has happened here. But let me set something up. Let me tell you what's happening in Numbers 32, 23. Two and a half of the tribes of Israel, two and a half of them, out of the twelve, are wanting to stay on the other side of the Jordan out of the promised land. The rest of them are going to go into the promised land and take it. And Moses says to that two and a, tribe of the two and a half that you had better go with them, the other tribes, and help them take the promised land. They, God said, or Moses said, through God, that you can keep this land over here on the other side, you two and a half tribes. But when it comes time to fight, to cross the Jordan in the book of Joshua, you've got to go with them. And then he tells them a warning if they do not go. Here's what he says in Numbers 32, 23. He said, but if you will not do so, if you won't go with them, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, because he instructed them to do it. And be sure your sin will find you out. Yes, amen. I ask myself a question. What does your sin will find you out mean? Somebody said, in the statement, be sure your sin will find you out, is revealed the mystery of sin. Keep that in your mind. It's revealed the mystery of sin. The nature of sin is such that whether or not others discover your sin, you know, in this case, Isaac's sin was discovered by somebody else and exposed to them, like David's was when he sinned against Uriah the Hittite with Bathsheba. But his, it says your sin will discover you. You ever run into somebody and you know they're miserable? There's a multitude of options of why that's so. But one of those options is sin in their life, if they're a saint. No saint can be happy. No saint can be joyous when there's unconfessed, unrepented of sin in their life. And that is the mystery of sin. It'll find you out. Nobody else may know about it, but it will find you out and it will drive you hopefully to repentance and forgiveness. This person goes on to say, you cannot run from the consequences. Sin carries within itself the power to pay the sinner back. And sin's payback is hell. And this particular writer is talking about the unbeliever, but that's not for the believer. For the, for the unbeliever, but for the believer, sin carries a temporal, I'm talking about in time, right now, judgment. If I do not make that right, God is going to judge me. He's going to chasten me. Not in hell, but temporally in time. This person goes on to say, or I have written here, it may be related to our family. Remember, remember what happened to David's family because of his sin? Remember David's health? Remember David's emotions? or even may be mentally related. Nobody else may know, but I'll tell you this. You'll not hide sin from God. It cannot, it cannot be hid from him. Right. And the consequences of those sins will come upon you, I guarantee it. You can put on, we can put on our best clothes and come in here. We can put on our best face and come in here. But I'll tell you what God knows. Amen. And you know. This person goes on to say that wrote this, don't even think about toying with sin. It cannot be tamed, outrun, or shaken off. No matter how safe you think you are, if you are a sinner or a saint practicing sin, I put that in, in there, your sin will find you out. There's no doubt about it. Isaac's sin is confronted by Abimelech here. And it's confronted with a question. And I'll tell you, I'd hate for that question to be asked of me or somebody worldly that just had morals. Yes. 
And when somebody look at me as a believer and have to confront me about my sin when I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. How's the only way to stay out of these types of things? Live life for God. That's it. Know the word of God and obey it. But look at verse 9. Here's Isaac's answer to Abimelech's question. Now the, the believer, you think about this, now the believer, Isaac, is going to show his faithlessness to the world. In verse number 9. And Isaac said unto him, because I said, lest I die for her. Remember, he was afraid, verse 7 said, that he would be killed for Rebekah. They would want Rebekah because of her beauty and do away with Isaac so they could have her. That's what he was fearful of. Even though God put him there, told him he'd bless him there, this was the fear that he had. And here's, here's what I think when I read those things. When I read a passage of scripture like the one we're reading this morning, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because it is somebody like Isaac who would normally live for the Lord. You know he's in the Hall of Fame of Faith, right? In Hebrews 11, Isaac is. In verses 20 and 21, he's spoken of. Does that not sadden you that somebody who would normally live for the Lord has got caught in this mess of sin? God gave a chance to make it right, and he wouldn't. And now, he's now turning to the tactics of the world in order to secure something for himself. That's what, that's what sin is. In this case, Isaac turns to lie in order to protect himself, as Abraham did in 20. I'll tell you what, there's no place for untruth in us. I'll tell you, lying is wrong. I don't care who you are. If you know Christ, it is detrimental to the cause of truth. It is heartbreaking to our Father. It is devastating to our spiritual well being. You say, I lie. What should I do? You should confess it as what it is. You say, Well, I did it to spare your feelings. I'll tell you, what about God? What's more important? We should just try maybe not to say anything, right? But I'll tell you what, there's no such thing as I, I've written before. There's no such thing as the fourth time of truth. A lie is a lie is a lie. They're not different colors. They're just lies. Mm -hmm. And when we find ourselves choosing to lie, we are on a dangerous path. Not only for ourselves, but for others also. And I'll tell you this, the hardest thing when a saint gets to this point is when they're defending their lives. You're in a terrible place. I'm in a terrible place. Because somebody maybe in this room just defended the lie they just told last. You're in a terrible place. I want you to know it. Get you God's forgiveness. He will forgive you. Yes. Look at verse 10. And Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might have lightly or easily to have lain or slept with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltless upon us. What a situation. The believer has caused the unbeliever to sin almost. I'll tell you what, that is ridiculous to me. It's just like we help sinners sin today when we join them when we should be in God's house. That's right. And we join them somewhere else and we show them this ain't important. We show them that this is take or leave. And we're just helping them. We're just encouraging that. I'll tell you, the world needs some sanctified believers. <laughs> And I'm not talking about this garbage that's in Campbell County that says what this I'm wearing is sanctified or where I'm going. I'm talking about living the truth of God's word out in our lives. That's sanctification. 
Not making stuff up that grandma and grandpa believed they made up. I'm talking about what the scriptures say. That's right. That's sanctification. But I'll tell you this the world, the church has joined the world in their sin. I want you to hear this. Maybe you'll tell somebody this, or maybe it'll be for you. But when you forsook the place God told you to be, when you forsook the book He told you to read and obey, You've joined them. And judge what's coming. Yeah. Yeah. On you, it will be temporal. <laughs> and it's, but it's going to be ugly, I can guarantee you. It's going to be the result of being places with your family and having no witness to them. Having no way to pray in any kind of power for them. Or for anyone else. I, and that's just one example. It is a multitude of things that happen. But does the church believe it? I don't believe so. But you will. You will. I'm telling you today though. What would God do if we would just repent of that? I'll tell you he'd be merciful. <laughs> yeah. He'd be so gracious and kind to us. But will the church do it? It's our choice. Amen. Look at verse number 11. Abimelech also knew that the Lord that he had no power to judge God's servant. He had no power to do such a thing. I'll tell you this, as a matter of fact, Abimelech, I believe, was afraid to do anything to Isaac. Because you remember what happened in Genesis 20 when this happened to Abraham. God made it to where Abimelech's people couldn't have children. He had no power over Isaac. So what does he do? Look at verse 11. And Abimelech charged all his people saying, he that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now let's close with this right here. There was a preacher who said this and Alice is going to come and sing and, or play. And, <coughs> but there's a preacher that said this. And, and I want to keep this in my mind and I hope you will too. Philip Brooks was his name. He said, truth is always strong no matter how weak it looks. <clears throat> Truth is always strong, no matter how weak it looks. And falsehood is always weak, no matter how strong it looks. Do you think <clears throat> the truth is what the church is using to get people into the house of God? No. Gimmicks. Programs. But you know what they need? Salvation. That'll get them in. That'll get them interested. That'll keep them in. But you know, we said, well, we're going to try this weakness of the world to get them in. And once that was over, it was just over. But I wanted to, I want to say this. As she's getting ready to play. <coughs> I don't want you to think God won't forgive you. Absolutely, he will. Yes. He's faithful and just to forgive us. If you'll confess it as sin and repent of it, he will forgive us. You're here this morning and you don't know Christ. You're on your way to hell. Listen, I'm telling you, Christ died for you. He was buried for you. He arose again for you. And if you'll trust him as your Savior, he'll save you out of that. If you'll live for him, you'll see the difference in your life, the rest of your life. And you have a great reward in eternity. You ought to do it this morning. You stand with me.